Many of us have learned how credit and debit work. First, a person has to apply for credit. Then when they attain the credit, then they use that credit, and then they incur a debt. And when that's done, they have to figure out how they're going to pay for that debt until the amount is paid in full. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes people run into hardships, like job losses, emergencies, health issues, or tragic deaths. And that causes their circumstances to change such that they are no longer able to continue fulfilling the agreed upon terms. That's when the debt issue then becomes a burden that was greater than was anticipated initially. The reason? The initial debt is now compounded by an unpaid interest and then late fees. And the damage to a person's credit record and the potential for repossession of properties or foreclosures and eviction are then compounded on already tragic and sad situation. Sadly, what was thought initially to be a reason for celebration on the outset has now turned into a cause for great concern and consternation. What was once a blessing has now become a burden. It can be a hard lesson for many to learn. I know for us trying to balance a home mortgage and car payments and credit card debt and raising our three children with all of their various expenses was a real challenge for us at times. Even when we moved into vocational ministry, we still had the challenges of managing our monthly finances and often on a meager income. Yet God always provided what we needed and we managed to fulfill our obligations. But there were times when we weren't sure that was going to be the case. It wasn't always easy. And in my preparation to fulfill my call to ministry, I spent 10 years pursuing an undergraduate degree, master's degree, and a doctorate degree, but I also incurred a lot of debt along the way. And I probably be paying for that for a number of years to come. Yes, I had qualified for the student loan credit, and I then incurred the debt that went along with it. Now I have a debt I owe. Most people incur debt at some point in their lives. Few, if any, rely solely on the payment of cash for services or products or major expenditures like higher education, vehicles, and homes. That means most likely, most of the people we know use credit to help them obtain such. The English word credit means in noun form, the ability of a customer to obtain goods or services before payment based on the trust that the payment will be made in the future. In verb form, to believe, put confidence in, trust, and have faith in. Well, after the product and service is attained through credit, a debt is incurred. The English word debt means, in noun form, something typically money that is owed or due, something that is owed or that one is bound to pay or to perform for another. Debt is an obligation that requires one party, the debtor, to pay money or other agreed upon value to another party, the creditor. Debt is a deferred payment or a series of payments, which differentiates it from an immediate purchase. When we think today in these terms of credit and debt, it usually is the latter that causes us the most concern. We don't like to be in debt. Debt is a burden that most of us would like to have lifted off of us. In fact, it's become a point of celebration when we pay off debt, and it should be. I've heard of people hosting lavish parties to celebrate paying off their mortgages, their school loans, and their wedding bills, because the burden of debt has finally, finally been lifted off of their shoulders. The Hebrew word for forgiven literally means lifted off. 
But that got me wondering if most of us would like to have the burden of a debt lifted off of us, why don't we then celebrate even more so the payment in full of the greatest debt any one of us could ever incur, the debt of sin, the forgiveness of sin. Now, before you answer, consider this story that was recently in the national news. Maybe like me, you saw the news story about how Robert F. Smith, the founder and chairman and CEO of Vista Equity Partners, stunned graduating seniors and Morehouse administrators during the commencement ceremony at the private men's college in Atlanta last May. With his surprise announcement that he would pay off their loans, more than 400 Morehouse College graduates received email letters Friday informing them of the amounts of their student loans that will be paid off by billionaire donor who pledged last spring to wipe out their loan debt of the entire graduating class of 2019. This is truly an amazing event to have an entire graduating class here during their commencement ceremony that their entire student debt would be paid in full by a wealthy benefactor. To help us allow this story to resonate with us, imagine that just moments before that announcement, while seated there with those graduates and their parents, they must have been wondering what the future would hold for them with those newly minted college degrees and hearts full of hopes and dreams, plans and pursuits that may have to be put on hold because there was also the burden of student loan debt, a debt that would take years to be paid in full. They could never have imagined that someone would be willing to take on their debt and in its place, give them the paid in full receipt right there and then. It had to be too good to be true, and yet it was true. The billionaire donors pledged to Morehouse College graduating class of 2019 would wipe out $34 million in student loan debt owed by those students and their parents. The college president called Smith's donation the liberation gift. It would be a life-changing event for the students and their families. He said, it is our hope that our graduates will use this newfound financial freedom to pursue their career goals, to lead and serve the community, and to remember the spirit of the gift given to them by paying it forward to support the education of future classes of Morehouse men. Now, back up with me to my earlier question. Why don't we celebrate more the payment in full of the greatest debt any of us could ever incur? A debt of sin. I think the answer is we don't fully realize the magnitude of what has been done for us. In short, God the Father sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay the full price for our sin debt on the cross of Calvary. And as Jesus did so, he cried out for the whole world to hear. As John 19.30 says, Tetelestai, meaning it is finished, paid in full. That's exactly what God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son had in mind. And when on the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. He was letting the whole world know loud and clear that sin debt, your sin debt, my sin debt, all sin debt was paid in full once for all, forever. Denny McDaniel in her commentary, The Power of Jesus' Last Words, the meaning behind it is finished, wrote, the Spurgeon Study Bible, a CSB translation edited by Alistair Begg explains, it is finished this way. There is only one Greek word for this utterance of our Lord. Although to translate it into English, we actually have to use three words, an ocean of meaning in a drop of language. When Christ became the final and ultimate sacrifice for our sin, the word in this verse 
finished, is actually from the Greek word tetelestai, which is the same word that means paid in full. Often it was used in an accounting term which indicates a debt was paid. The uniqueness about the way it was written in the tense of the word indicates both a point in time it was complete and that it would also continue to be complete or finished. And this is the essence of what Christ came to do. He came to finish God's work of salvation in us. He came to pay it in full, the entire penalty, our debt for our sins forever. It's complete. I can't help but think how many people who call themselves Christians, born again believers in Jesus Christ, who have supposedly turned their lives over to him as savior and found forgiveness of sin and accepted him as Lord of their lives and confessed that he is Lord and God, fail to grasp the significance of his words and what it really means for them. Jesus didn't cry out at the top of his, his voice, here's the down payment, or it's going to have to be made in installments, or it's going to require a balloon payment at some later point, or I'm just a co-signer. They're really the ones who will have to keep up the payments. No, none of that. Jesus cried out, it is finished, paid in full. God not only wants us to know that our sin debt has been paid in full, God wants us to know what it means for us today and for tomorrow and every day after that and for all of eternity. We are free from our sin debt, free from the consequences of that sin debt. We are free forever. Jesus said, if any man be in me, he is free indeed. Join me as we look for what God's word has for us today in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. By the cross. It's important for you and I as we look at these truths of God's Word and what it reveals to us today as powerful takeaways that literally free us up and can transform our lives and allow us to live as God has created us and called us to live as free people in Jesus Christ. No longer under the debt of sin, but free, free in Christ. First, dead to God, made alive in Christ, forgiven forever. Verse 13 of our text reveals the truth of our dire circumstances, our desperate situation, and what God so undeservedly did for us. We were dead in our sins. God made us alive in Christ. He forgave us our sins, all our sins. Oh, I know that some people don't like to think of themselves as sinners in need of a savior, but we were dead in our sins and had no hope to be made right with God, our creator, to enjoy a right relationship with, with him and to live at peace and not at enmity, war with God, so that we could enjoy the fellowship we once knew before the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden. That was lost to us forever. Such was the plan of evil when Adam and Eve sinned against God. But that wasn't the end of the story. The scripture reveals, but God made a way where there was no way. John MacArthur writes in his commentary on the text, unbelievers are bound in the sphere of sin, the world and the flesh and the devil. So they are unable to respond to spiritual stimuli, totally devoid of spiritual life. Paul further defines this condition of the unsaved in 1 Corinthians 2, Ephesians 4, and Titus 3. 
He has made us alive with him, Christ. It's only through the union with Jesus Christ we see in verses 10 and 11, can those hopelessly dead in their sin receive eternal life. Note that God takes the initiative and exerts the life-giving power to awaken and unite sinners with his son. The spiritually dead have no ability to make themselves alive. The phrase, forgiven you all your trespasses or has forgiven us all our sin, God's free and complete forgiveness of guilty sinners who put their faith in Christ Jesus is the most important reality in all of Scripture. What does that mean for us today? It means that we could strive our whole lives to do what we think is right. Strive to be that kind of person the world would call a person who does right, acts justly, tries to be pure, seeks to do good for others, obeys the laws, is tolerant of others, is a decent all-around human being, a nice person, a loving, thoughtful, kind-hearted, generous, would give the shirt off his back kind of person, always ready to help the poor and needy, often serving with their time and their talent and their treasure, willing to take in strays, human and otherwise, and willing to help anybody and everybody in every way they possibly can, always appearing to be loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and gentle and faithful and thoughtful and self-controlled. And yet the truth of Scripture is this, and we would still be dead in our sins apart from God. That's a tough thing for us to acknowledge, that apart from Christ, we have no hope. Apart from his indwelling Holy Spirit, upon the moment of salvation, we couldn't even approach a Holy Father God. Even at our best, our best is like filthiness before God the Father, Isaiah 64, 6 tells us. God did what only God could do. God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were, as in Romans 4, 17 says, reveals this incredible truth. God took what was dead and made it alive. God took what was filthy and made it holy. That's what God did for us, for you, for me, forever. Secondly, God canceled our debt. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Verse 14 reveals what God so graciously did for us and how God did it at great cost to himself. Yes, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, dead to God and made alive to God in Christ, and God forgave us all our sins. God canceled the charge of our indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. John MacArthur continues in his commentary, the Greek word translated handwriting referred to the handwritten certificate of debt by which every debtor acknowledged his indebtedness. All people owe God an unpayable debt for violating his law. We see this in Romans 3.23, Galatians 3.10, and James 2.10, and also Matthew 18, 23 through 27, and are thus under the sentence of death, Romans 6.23 teaches. Paul graphically compares God's forgiveness of believers' sin to wiping the ink off the parchment, erasing it as though it had never been there before. Through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, God totally erased our certificate of indebtedness and made our forgiveness complete, clean, perfect, forever. How? Nailed it to the cross. This is another metaphor for forgiveness. The list of crimes of a crucified criminal were nailed to the cross with that criminal to declare the violations he was being punished for, as in the case of Jesus. And we see this in Matthew 27, 37. He took on our sin. Believers' sins were all put to Christ's account. Nailed to his cross. He paid the penalty for our sins and thus satisfying the just wrath of God 
against the crimes required punishment and payment in full. But it came at a price. Sin always has a price. It always will. Someone has to pay. God's word reveals there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22 teaches. Julie Cameron writes in her commentary on the topic, Our life was forfeited because of sin, but Jesus' blood was shed to forgive and restore us to a state as if we had never sinned in the first place. Hebrews 10.14, Hebrews 10.18, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 9.12, and Hebrews 9.26, and Hebrews 10.10 all help us understand this. What an amazing truth. He knew the price to bring us to the Father and in his own words testified to the fact that he would let the blood flow freely. He knew his blood would usher in the covenant and would then completely and utterly blot out and destroy the effects and the stains of sin. His perfect blood was shed to usher in both the new covenant and the forgiveness of sins. Neither one could be accomplished without which is why he freely gave himself to the will of the Father. Jesus accomplished what we could not, and because of his sacrifice, we have been forgiven, freed, and offered eternal life through the person of Jesus Christ. The text reveals another wonderful truth. Thirdly, God disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Verse 15 reveals the way God did it and when. Turning again to MacArthur who writes, in yet another incredible element of the cross work, Paul tells that the cross spelled the ultimate doom of Satan and his evil host of fallen angels. The principalities and powers, while Jesus' body was dead, his living divine spirit actually went to the abode of demons and announced his triumph over sin, death, and hell. Upon his death, Jesus literally went to hell where Satan and his fallen angels dwell and kicked in the door to demonstrate his victory over sin and Satan, death and hell, those principalities and powers of darkness. And not only that, he was gonna do it in a very public way for all the world to see. And when he cried out to Telestai, to tell them it's done, it's coming, it's over. He did it in such a public spectacle triumphing over them. The picture is that of a victorious Roman general parading his defeated enemies through the streets of Rome, MacArthur writes. Christ won the victory over the forces of darkness on the cross, where their efforts to halt God's redemptive plan and purpose were ultimately defeated. Debbie McDaniel says, people sin every day. They did then, and we do now. And that sin costs us greatly. It separates us from God. It sets up a barrier. It leads to further drifting away from what we know to be right and often leads us into great despair. That hope that we have now because of Christ's death on the cross and his ultimate sacrifice on our behalf is this. He completed the work. He paid the sacrifice in full on our behalf. No other payment is needed. He just asked that we accept his gift of forgiveness and life. I know that when we read this text, we are prone to wonder, it sounds good, but maybe it's just too good to be true. But it is true. But what exactly does that mean for you and I today? John Kincaid writes in his Peace and Believing Ministries, Paul spoke of a certificate of debt. In the first century, a bill of indebtedness was written over each prisoner. The Romans posted this bill outside the prison cell until the debt was paid. To cancel debt when it was satisfied, they wrote across the bill to Telestai, paid in full. Christ's last word on the cross was to tell us that. Paid in full, it is finished. 
on the day of atonement, the high priest made an offering for the sins of Israel during the year. Leviticus 16, 8 through 26 teaches us. He chose two goats. One was sacrificed. One was released into the wilderness, carrying away the sins. The live goat was called a scapegoat. The problem was, sometimes this goat wandered back into town. This was a bad omen. Like having their sins come back on them. Some ancient sources report that the scapegoat was sometimes then led to a cliff and pushed off. The reason you can't lose your salvation is that your sins have been pushed off the cliff. They're gone. Never more to be seen. How do we know that we have forgiveness of sin and eternal life and security in Christ? Well, God's word teaches us in Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 12, and also in verse 14. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this high priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Lauren Berg writes in a commentary on this, the perfection that comes from Jesus' sacrifice had no end, even though those who have been made perfect are still in the process of being made holy. What makes us perfect is not what we do, but what Jesus did on our behalf. His infinite perfection cannot be stained by our imperfections. If we have put our trust in Jesus' death to pay the penalty for our sin, we can be confident that sins from our past, our present, and our future are forgiven, all because of the perfection of Jesus' sacrifice. The sacrifice Jesus has made should motivate us to avoid sin and live a life that is pure, not because we're afraid of losing our forgiveness, but because we want to reflect the character of Jesus more and more. That is true freedom. For the genuine believer, those who have turned from their sin and placed their faith hope and trust in Christ as Savior and asked him to forgive their sin. Christ has saved them. He is saving them and he will save them on that day of final judgment. All our sins are forgiven, all, not some, not most, all of our sins, all sins past, all sins present, all sins we'll commit in the future. All of our sins are forgiven forever. Christ promises to cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 19 teaches. Isaiah 43, 25 teaches. How far does God go to remove our sin from us? As far as the east is from the west. An immeasurable distance because east and west will never meet. In a metaphorical sense, God puts all our sins behind his back so that he does not see them anymore, Isaiah 38, 17 teaches. God not only erases our sin debt, he destroys the document on which our sin was recorded by nailing it to the cross. We are forgiven by the cross of Jesus. We are forgiven because of the cross of Christ. As the hymn writer Horatio G. Spafford penned, it is well with my soul. He so eloquently articulated this beautiful refrain. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul gave considerable thought to all of this as I was finishing my sermon. And I concluded how I could best 
illustrate this incredible truth to others who may not still grasp the significance of it all. So using my own student loan debt as an illustration, I surmised, suppose someone approached me and said, I know of someone who's taken note of your circumstances and has offered to take on all your student loan debt. In fact, they are willing to pay your student loan debt off with a liberation gift mindset, one that's intended to be a life-changing gift for you. What a generous and gracious offer, I might think. I would likely respond, as many would, that sounds incredible, wonderful, to think that I would be free of this incredible burden of debt completely. Yes, it would change my life and it would free me up to do so many wonderful more things uh, in my life and, and, and allow us to live a life more abundant. Without that burden, to have it lifted off of us. So having heard the offer and accepted the marvelous free gift, then having received the notice that my student loan debt had in fact been paid in full, instead of responding as I said I would, I instead continued to make the monthly payments, managing my finances, living as though nothing had changed. In short, I continued to live as though paying the debt was still completely up to me. The burden had never been lifted. And I was living life as though I had never realized any of the benefits of having that debt paid in full. All the while, I could have, I could have been free, had that debt lifted off of my shoulders. I would have been free from the burden of debt and I could have lived in such a way as to be able to help others and do more for my family and live that life abundantly to be able to experience a true freedom as I had not known in years. The problem? While the debt had been paid in full, I never really accepted the practicality of that truth, the truth that that gift had been given. I may have understood it intellectually, or even gone so far as to emotionally rejoice at receiving it, but never went so far as to allow the reality of that gift to alter my thinking, my feeling, and my behavior, and my life in such a way that it reflected the receiving of that gift. Instead, I chose to remain in an attitude of debt, never availing myself to all the benefits of having that debt paid in full was intended to provide. And worse, dishonored the giver of the gift by negating the reason for the gift being given to begin with. The gift that had been intended to liberate me from that burden, to allow it to be lifted off and allow me to live a life unencumbered so that I could live a life full of joy and freedom. Instead of enjoying that, I remained a prisoner of that debt. Now, I recognize that to some people, this analogy is ludicrous. It's ridiculous to think that anyone would do that. They would argue no one would do such a thing. Well, to that I would counter. People have been doing that very thing since... Christ paid the price for our sin on the cross of Calvary. Our sin debt has been paid in full. When Christ cried out from the cross to Telestai, he was saying it is finished, it is paid in full, and yet some continue to live as though they are unforgiven, hopelessly lost in their sin. They don't really believe what God's word teaches. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. It's hard for us to accept something that sounds so good to be true as truth. 
Can I challenge you as the people of God to not willingly choose to forfeit God's gift of mercy, grace, and love, his forgiveness for all your sin, past, present, and future, and miss out on the life that God has freed you to live? That new life in Christ, the abundant life he came to give you, and that debt that God desired to lift off of your shoulders, to liberate you from, to forgive you from forever? Can I, can I ask you to stop right now and just say, God, thank you. I accept your gift of mercy, grace, and love, forgiveness of my sin, all my sins, past, present, and future that you have given me and extended to me through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Help me to live the life you have set me free to live. That burden, lift it off, free in Christ forever. Can I ask you to pray and ask God to remind you that you have had that debt paid in full. And then live as though it has been. Live as he intended. Live that abundant life here and now, that new life in Christ Jesus, free from sin and his death. You can accept God's gift of mercy, grace, and love and join that growing chorus of voices that praises God for his goodness, his mercy, his grace, and his love shown to them, how God has so lavishly poured out all of the blessings of heaven on us in Christ Jesus. Like that old hymn says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand, in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Before we go, Allow me to show you how Old Testament version of this praise would look. In Psalm 103, the psalmist wrote, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Until next time. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace.